It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast on what will be an exceedingly busy week as we have the Sweet 16, obviously, in the uh, NCAA tournament. Baseball right around the corner with opening day on uh, Thursday. Uh, tomorrow, we will have our uh, baseball podcast up. We'll preview the Yankees and the Mets up to date. Injuries included, perspective up to the minute. Uh, if you're looking at those totals right now, the Yankees are 91 and a half. That's amended down from really 93 and a half pretty much everywhere. Uh, so they took two games off with the injuries, especially the one to Cole. And the Mets are at 80 and a half. It's been pretty solid there. And the Met variables are pretty wide ranging because you can see a lot of change in the team during the season. And there's a real wide gap of performance in the team. There really is uh, a lot of unknowns and everything else. Uh, so uh, we'll get to those two and the other baseball over unders tomorrow. Uh, today, kind of a potpourri. We'll do the uh, Sweet 16, give you some thoughts on that. Uh, we'll also do the NFL rule changes, one of which uh, has got me really annoyed. Uh, and uh, let me open with Atani. I've stayed away from Atani so far, but it's a story of such magnitude, uh, and it is everywhere, that it's hard to stay away from. So I watched the Atani, if you want to call it a press conference, really wasn't. It was more kind of just like the Atani uh, statement through an interpreter. And I thought he did more harm than good with it because once you go in and don't address obvious questions and then refuse to take questions, you anger more people than you uh, basically draw to your side. Now, there are a lot of baseball people rooting hard for Tony. There are a lot of baseball reporters who are apologizing for Tony and, you know, saying, oh, I, I see his point. I take everything he said. I really think he did a great job. I heard a lot of that. And I'm like, what? How could you possibly say that? Because there's two things that come out of that that jump off the page that have not been answered. Number one, how did the interpreter, Okay, if you're going to believe version two now, not version one, you're going to believe version two. Version one was Atani gave him the money to pay off the bookmaker. Now version two, the interpreter lied, made it all up. Atani knew nothing about it, nothing about anything. That's version two. Now, he's hired a PR, a crisis PR management people, which a lot of times can do as much harm as good. Number two, the Dodgers are trying to be involved, and they said they've turned it over authorities, but no authorities have said they're involved in any way because they said they don't know yet that a crime has been committed. Because if Atani was involved in the wire transfers, there's no crime. So we're not sure who's involved yet. FBI said they weren't involved. LAPD said they weren't involved. All right, so we don't know any of that yet. Now, there's two things that jump off the page that until you get an answer to, an answer to, there's no way you have any, it really furthered this at all. Number one, how would the interpreter possibly get access to Atani's accounts? If you have had employees, you don't give them access to your financial accounts. You don't give anybody access to your financial accounts. Number two, has anybody ever sent a wire? There is a protocol that goes with sending a wire out of a bank account or a financial account that includes the following because I've done it on numerous occasions. Number one, multiple levels of communication with the bank or the financial institution, including emails, texts, and phone calls. Number two, special access codes that are passed back and forth to prove that it's you sending the wire. Number three, they even, the bank idea with even brings a second person in 
and runs the whole protocol through a second person after we've already done it with the first person to make sure there have been no slip-ups. And you're trying to tell me that these guys in story one sat at a computer and rifled off half a million dollar bank transfers and wire transfers one after another? And then the fanciful number two story, the interpreter made it all up. He lied. I knew nothing about it. Atani is trying to convince you that, A, the interpreter got access to his accounts and sent four and a half million dollars worth of wire transfers to the bookie. And B, that Atani never noticed that his account was light four and a half million dollars for months. Seriously? He didn't know he was missing four and a half million dollars? So how is anybody with a shred of common sense believing anything about this story yet until you get those answered? There's no way the interpreter has access to your accounts. You can't steal and make wire. You can't make wire transfers as a third party. There's a protocol and safeguard against it in every institution and bank I've ever dealt with. You're telling me that he got access to Atani's accounts, Atani didn't know it, and then he was able to rifle off a handful of $500,000 wire transfers and nobody called him on it, nobody checked him on it? The bank didn't notify Atani or ask for Atani's approval? Complete nonsense. The bank would call me if someone tried to transfer anything out of my account without me calling them. It can't be done. A request would be a phone call right to me. The idea that that didn't happen is ludicrous. To the tune of four and a half million dollars? What do you think, these banks and financial institutions are stupid? They let this go on for months at a time and never contacted Atani or Atani's representatives if there's somebody who handles his finances. If Atani's dumb enough to give somebody access to his private accounts, which I don't know if he does or he doesn't, I don't know how he works, but he shouldn't even do that. Number two, if he did it, you're telling me the bank allowed four and a half million dollars to be taken out and never once contacted the guy whose name is on the account. That is past impossible. Past impossible. It did not happen anywhere in this world. That did not happen in the banking institution. Did not happen. I've dealt with multiple banks and with financial institutions that have accounts that have different kinds of investments in them, and you send anything, you transfer anything, and we've all done it through the years, and it is an entire protocol. including phone calls, text messages, security codes, and everything else. And special one-time passwords that have to be exchanged back and forth by phone and by text. So the idea that none of this went on is nonsense. There is no way that money came out of Atani's account and he had not granted permission to somebody to send it. Because it can't be done. And you're start trying to tell us that, first of all, an interpreter, I don't care how close he was to Atani, an interpreter was allowed to go into Atani's accounts whenever he wanted 
and to move around millions of dollars? <laughs> Who's buying that? So we got story one. Then we got story two, which was I knew nothing about anything. I had not been told anything. And I did not know about the money being taken out of my accounts. I had no idea. I'm the victim of theft. I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a second. Unless you're telling me that this guy is able to impersonate Atani to the point of it being so good that his own family wouldn't know it was him. Because otherwise, it cannot be done. And the idea that he would not be notified about a $4.5 million shortfall in his accounts is nonsense. When you make a wire transfer, it comes back to you 10 days later in a statement that said you transferred this from this account into this account on this date, this amount. Here were the protocols, everything. And that's 10 days after the fact. It comes in in paper. They set up an enormous safeguard for these wire transfers. I know I've done enough of my telling you. I know exactly how they work. And I don't expect Tani to have maybe as much time to know his people on the other end as I do. I know the people on the other end who handle my accounts personally. I've dealt with them for many, many years, the same people. And when I want to do it, it starts with a phone call from me to the person directly. No wires, no computers, nothing. Hey, I want to do this. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Boom, boom, boom. That's how it starts every time, with a verbal statement from me. So the idea that he just gets up and just ships, you know, takes a computer and, and fires off all these $500,000 wire transfers to a bookmaker is a bunch of nonsense. I don't buy for a second that Tony didn't know about it. I don't know what happened here. I'm not telling you I know a Tony gambled. I'm not telling you Atani knew the bookie directly. All I'm telling you is Atani knew what was going on in his accounts. And he had to approve those transfers because there's no way they happen if he didn't. And allowing nine of them to go without ever contacting him would make the bank or the financial institution liable. That's just ridiculous. So we are a long way from the end of this story. They told you last night to turn it over to the authorities. Nonsense. The authorities said nobody's turned anything over to us. There's been no call of a crime being committed. The FBI, we got reports the FBI was involved. The FBI is not involved. They stated yesterday they were not involved. The LAPD said they were not involved. So we heard round one. We heard the complete change in round two. There is going to be a round three. I don't know what's coming. I have no idea. I am not saying I know that he gambled. I'm not saying he bet on baseball. I'm not saying anything of the, of the kind. I am not saying Atani did that. But. I am not buying for one second that he was not aware of what was going on in his accounts. That I am not buying. That part makes no sense. So we'll wait for version three, because there's going to be a version three. I mean, that's one of the strangest, to the tune of four, this guy's making an $82,000 salary and his gambling debts are to the tune of four and a half million? If you're a bookmaker, 
You think you're taking bets from a guy to that kind of tune if you don't know the money's good on the other end? Not a chance. No bookmaker would take those kind of bets unless they knew the money was good. Never, ever, ever would they take that bet. There's not a chance. They don't work that way. So they thought there was money on the other side. So I don't know if Otani has any culpability from a gambling standpoint. I have no idea. And I'm not accusing him of that. What I am accusing him of is not telling us the whole story. I am completely accusing him of that. So we'll wait and see. Now to the NFL. Before I get to your Sweet 16 and then get to the uh, emails. Now, three rule changes in the NFL. One easy one. You... You hit on either one of your first two challenges, you get a third challenge. Good. That, that's not, I, I, I'm fine with that. First or second, you get a third. Good. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. No problem. Number two, they've made the hip drop tackle, which I would think at least most, if not 80% of football fans don't even know what, what people are talking about, um, is now a 15-yard penalty. They didn't outlaw it. They made it a 15-yard penalty. All right? That one, they said the incidence of it went up dramatically last year because people are trying not to use their helmet. Okay? That's the, they're being taught now to use this tactic rather than use their helmet. And the NFL thinks it has caused too many guys being th- knocked out of the game Andrews was an example. Geno Smith was an example. Go down the line, and they thought it was too much, so now they've made it a 15-yard penalty. And they want the league to stop teaching it. Now to the big one. We know the kickoff has been taken out of football. We know the onside kick has been taken out of football. They took all the fun out of the onside kick, all the drama out of the onside kick, which stinks. Why? Because they think there's too many incidents of, of hits and, and concussions on kickoff-related plays. So now they come up with this gimmick kickoff. It's only a one-year trial. But you need to watch it on video to get the full extent. If I try to explain it all to you right now, you're not going to pick it up. In essence, what you have is... Most of the, the, it's like this play, they tried to turn it into a play from scrimmage rather than the long distance created on the kickoff. I don't like it at all. I think it's a gimmick. I don't know why to keep screwing with the game. It's a rough sport. We know that. They shouldn't try to use the helmet as a weapon. We know that. Defenseless wide receivers across the middle don't have to be targeted. We know that. They've done a good job of of trying to legislate that stuff. But to ruin the game like this, go look at it. You'll get the drift. I don't like it even a little. And I think it'll be a one-year thing. I don't like it even a little. Now, just to show you how ridiculous it is, you no longer can have a surprise onside kick under this situation. Again, There can't be because you're not lined up in the same place. You're not lined up like a regular kickoff. So if you say now we want, there are no surprise onside kicks, they're now banned because they can't be used. So now if you say we're going to kick onside, then you go back to the old kickoff and then kick onside with the rule the same way, which means you can't win an onside kick anyway because you can't overload. So they've, they've taken the onside kick drama out of the sport completely, which I can think of some great games where the onside kick was a big factor. And you can have no surprise onside kicks now, never. Because you have to declare it so they can go back to the old kicking formation 
and and line up at the right yard line to let you do it. So when you have to do that, it tells you what a folly this is. And I hate the idea of it. I hate it. They have messed with special teams to the point where they have taken special teams so much out of the game, it's sickening. They have a great game. Leave it alone. I understand you want to protect against some violent hits. And especially using the helmet as a weapon. More power to you. Do that. But this kind of stuff, I'm dead set against it in every way. And I detest this thing before it starts. I completely detest it. I hate the idea of it in every way. Now, my final four teams are still alive, so I'm sticking with them. That's UConn to win it all, and I've seen nothing that would, uh, except them taking it soft in the second half of both games. Um, they had huge leads at halftime of both games, including a 40-18 to 18 lead against Northwestern that they didn't play at all in the second half against Northwestern. And they were lucky to cover. Um, but they did. And if you know, you heard me talk about it the other day, of how boring until the crazy Houston, Texas A&M finish, this has been the most boring first week in the games in the history of the tournament. It's also most lopsided. Uh, the favorites, the one and two seeds, have done better in this tournament than any tournament in the history of the tournament. They've covered more. They've had more wide, uh, wide, uh, you know, margins of victory. Uh, it's been the most lopsided tournament in the history of the NF NCA. Which I told you that two days ago before they did the stats on it. We knew it was that way anyway. You have all eight, one, two seeds here. You have twelve of the sixteen seeds here, and you have no Cinderella teams here. A team being masqueraded as a Cinderella is NC State. They're an ACC champion. I mean, come on, they're not a Cinderella. I understand they were 11 C, but they were 11 C because they had a bad season and they run off a bunch of games and win the ACC. If they can win the ACC, they're not a Cinderella team. San Diego State's not a Cinderella team. They won the championship game last year. There are no Cinderellas here. There are no mid majors here. There's 16 major schools here most of them powerhouses it sets up some very rugged games here San Diego State UConn a championship rematch from last year Illinois Iowa State should be a tremendous game offense versus defense Alabama North uh, North Carolina get ready that will be a track mate of track meets Sears might score 40 Gonzaga playing very well against Providence. Gonzaga can win that game. I don't think they will, but they definitely can. Duke Houston, dangerous game. Dangerous game for Houston. Banged up, not deep against Duke, which is now playing the best basketball it's played all year. Creighton, Tennessee. The defense of Tennessee, the offense and three-point shooting of Creighton. Creighton doesn't commit fouls, but they've got to keep Tennessee off the offensive glass. Very pretty Creighton, likes to move the ball, likes to pass the ball, likes to shoot the ball from the perimeter against Tennessee. Rugged, fierce defensive team. Physical in nature. Two very different styles. Same thing with Duke and Houston. Very different styles. Same thing with Illinois and Iowa State. Very different styles. Thursday night, Clemson, Arizona. San Diego State, UConn. Alabama, North Carolina. Illinois, Iowa State. Clemson's had a great run I'm not an Arizona fan. I think Arizona wins. UConn, the question is, does anybody play them close? I think San Diego State is rugged. I think they're very well coached. I think they'll hang in. 
they'll make the game a half court game a little less so than last year, but make it a half court game. UConn will win it probably double digits, but it probably won't be a blowout. Alabama, North Carolina, first one, the hundred wins. Uh, Alabama will not think twice about running with Carolina. Carolina won't think twice about running with Alabama. They are going to go back and forth up the floor. Three point shooters going to have a lot to say in that game. A lot to say. I think Alabama can win that game in an upset. Illinois, Iowa State, flip a coin. I'm taking Illinois for one reason. Shannon. I get the idea he's not going to be denied here in this game. But that's a very a classic. If one game is slated to come down to the last play of the game, it's that one. NC State Marquette. NC State can play with them. There's no question about it. I think they will, too. But Marquette's got too many weapons. Gonzaga-Purdue, I think, is going to be a very good game. Very good. I think Purdue survives, but I think it's going to be very tough. Duke-Houston, same thing. I think it's going to be a very close game. I think Houston will get by him. But I think that uh, Duke showed you a little different side in that in that games uh, this this Sunday and they will have to lift that and play very very rugged ball against Houston because Houston commands that from you they de- they demand that from you they make you play that way and then I think Creighton Tennessee is a toss up I think Tennessee edges them because I don't think Creighton will play defense well enough and I think T- Tennessee will get just enough easy baskets. See, Tennessee did not m- play well against Texas. And if Texas had shot the ball, but Tennessee's defense was a big part of that. If if Texas had shot the ball anywhere near normal, they would have won. They had their chance to tie the game in the final 20 seconds, um, but Max missed the shot. Uh, I think this game will be very close also, but I think Tennessee will eke it out. But I stake with my four. I'm not amending the... UConn, Houston, Purdue, and Bama. That's what I picked before I started. That's what I'll stay with right here as we go forward. So I think Alabama's going to edge Carolina in a 90. First one to 95 probably wins. Your emails when we return. You're listening to the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. All right, send your emails to Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, tomorrow, baseball. We'll do the over-unders. I have three already in the bank. I need three more, so I'm I'm still looking. I I have my three overs. I need my three unders. I'll work on those for you tomorrow, and I'll include the Mets and Yankees in there. Um, so we'll do the Yankees, preview the Mets, preview the Yankees, and everything else tomorrow with the podcast. Now, Randy starts us off. What is your take on Atani? I just gave you that. So, hey, to me. Let's hear the truth about the accounts because we haven't gotten that yet. We got story one. Atani bailed him out, sent the emails, even made a comment that the most he could send was 500. So that's why he didn't send more. Understood how much was owed. You're telling me an interpreter comes to you who's not a relative and says to you, I'm in trouble I owe the bookmaker four and a half million dollars and you just happily write the checks. Wow. Really? Just happily write the checks for four and a half million dollars. I understand he's got a lot of money, but nobody writes checks happily for four and a half million dollars. If somebody else is losing nobody, not the richest man in the world. How did the interpreter get access to his accounts? Why would he have access to his accounts? And he still can't send the emails without a Tony. Send the uh, wires without a Tony. Can't be done. Do you have any thoughts to share on the passing of Peter Angelos? Did you know him? I did not. Uh, as an owner, how should he be remembered? 
not a very popular owner, not a very happy owner, someone who should have got out of the sport a lot earlier than he did. Nick, does Kentucky at least have to think about letting Calipari go after another uh, tournament exit? I'm sure they've thought about it, Nick. But as I told you the first night after they lost, and I, I, and I saw all the rumblings on social media and all the fire Cal and everything else and hire Jay Wright and all that stuff that was going on, I told you that night his buyout was 30 Three million dollars. Nobody's paying that. Nobody. This was more on Cal than it was on his kids. Now, I understand his kids played tight and they had an all year, but that's on him. He's got to have them ready and he's got to have them ready for the defense that Oakland's going to play. And his freshmen played really bad in that game, including the heavily honored Reed Shepard, who had a terrible game. But he's not going anywhere to the tune of $33 million in the buyout. Thomas, do you think the Giants regret moving on from Tom Coughlin? Now, yes. Um, it's funny, Tom built Jacksonville from the point that he got there before they even had a team. It was a lot like Buck Showalter there with Arizona, and he detailed everything, including the uniform, including the socks, including everything, which Tom loved. He detailed everything. I remember seeing Tom the year he wasn't coaching. He was in the giant press box that year when he was off when he left Boston College and, you know, he, he was getting them ready to play the next year. And, uh, you know, they were, had very liberal and got a very positive draft. Uh, both Carolina and Jacksonville got good fast because they were given a lot of players, the access to a lot of players. Uh, so they both got off to very good starts. He built them into a team that was a championship-level team. And trying to win that championship, Remember, they went to the AFC title game twice and, uh, uh, and lost both times. Um, they went into the salary cap hell, and he got into a dispute with the front office trying to build a championship team and then couldn't get out of salary cap hell and had a, bad, a, a really bad year, and Weaver fired him. And Wayne Weaver said later in his career it was the biggest mistake he ever made letting Tom Coughlin go. And... Listen, Tom had three bad years for the Giants in a row. That's hard for an ownership to deal with. They're starting to think that it's the end of the line. In retrospect, would it probably have made sense to keep him? Yeah, but you know what? They didn't, and they had a right to let him go. I don't think they can be second-guessed for letting him go, but it turned out to be a bad move. Chris, what are the realistic expectations for Volpe off his rookie season? Um, I think positive. Number one, he really played very sound defense, and he didn't let his offensive inconsistencies hurt his defense. I did not think he deserved this, a gold glove. He was, not, he was a very solid shortstop. He was not a gold glove shortstop, in my mind. Um, he showed power. He showed speed. I think this year you can expect 20 doubles, 25 steals, 20, 20 to 25 homers, and a little better batting average and a little better on base percentage, but nothing tremendous. I don't think he'll hit 250. I think maybe he'll hit 240. Um, I think he will, I think it will take him another year. I think it will take him another year or two to get the batting average and the on-base percentage 
up to where you want it to be. I think that will that will take time, but you're getting some power. He's not yet a leadoff hitter. I don't know if he'll ever be. Okay? Last year he hit 209 with 21 homers and 24 steals. I think you can count on this, you know, a little edge up in the homers. He had 62 runs scored. I think he'll have 80. I think he had uh, 23 doubles. Give him 23 to 25. I give him 20 to 25 homers. I think his on-base percentage, uh, I think his strikeouts will be right around the same, somewhere between 150 and 160. He had 167 last year. 209 batting average, I think he could get up to somewhere around 230, 240. And his on-base percentage, you'd like to see him get it from 280 to 300 minimum this year. He doesn't walk. He doesn't walk. That's the one thing. He does not walk. He, he uh, struck out 167 times and walked 50 times playing a full season. Uh, in, 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 you know, in 160 games, 50 walks is not a lot. Um, I think he'll get better with the strike zone. I think he's not a leadoff hitter. I think he belongs in the bottom of the lineup now. With LeMayu Hurd, he'll probably bat leadoff. I would rather he bats leadoff than Torres. I don't like Torres in the top spot. So with LeMayu out, with LeMayu out, I would bat, I would bat him leadoff because I, I got to be honest, I really don't have any other choice, you know, to bat anybody leadoff. I, I really don't. Um, you know, I'm trying to give, think of options. They don't really have, you know, Torres is not a leadoff hitter. Verdugo is not a leadoff hitter. If Grisham's in the lineup, if you have a day where he's DHing uh, and Grisham's playing center field, and I think there'll be more of those grays than you think, when Grisham's in the lineup, I bat him leadoff. So if he's in the lineup, I bat him lead off if, if Judge is DHing. If Judge is in center field, then I would lead off Volpe while LeMayu is out of the lineup. I do not like leading off Torres. So from that standpoint, that's where I would be. So right now with LeMayu out, if Grisham's in the lineup, he bats first. I, he won't be in the lineup every day, but he'll be in the lineup you know, one or two days a week where they'll put Judge at DH. Or a judge will get a corner outfield one day and someone else gets a day off, then Grisham will be in center field. If he's in center field, he bats lead off if there's no LeMayo. And LeMayo's starting the year on the uh, on the shelf, so we know that. So um, with him out, I would start Volpe at leadoff. And if Grisham's in, I would play Grisham at leadoff. Volpe's not a real leadoff hitter, but I like him better than Torres. I just think he fits the bill better. And I, I don't want to turn Torres into a guy who's thinking different things when he's a leadoff hitter. Torres is a, is, a, is a six hitter who's there to drive the baseball. That's his job. The Yankee lineup is going to be vastly improved because of the left-handed presence and because of the presence of one of the great players in baseball in Soto, who, you know, could, you know, is, is sitting on a, a reason to have a huge year is going to fit Yankee Stadium like a bill, uh, like 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 to a T. He's going to be uh, perfect if they put him in the two spot and put Judge in the three spot. That would be uh, tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Um, uh, I you know his on base percentage is always brilliant. I can't remember if I heard this, but I heard somebody say they were asked, would they take Soto in his prime or A-Rod? And they said take Soto. you got to be kidding me. you got to rethink that one. Whether you like A-Rod or not, Soto is not A-Rod. Not yet. He could have a great season. And he could have an MVP season. But if you think he's had a career so far where he's A-Rod, you got to look again. You know, you're not thinking about how good A-Rod's career was. A-Rod's career was off the charts. If he hadn't had the scandals 
you would have been talking about one of the greatest players who ever lived. That's how good his numbers are. Now, he threw a lot away. If you're the first to admit that, he completely threw it away. With his steroid use and his lies, he completely threw it away. But if you look at it just based on the numbers, his career is scary. Scary good. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.